Surely this is one of the critical apologetic challenges of our time. Um, I often say if I meet a non-Christian and we start talking uh, about faith, or if I go out to a dinner party and the topic of my being a Christian comes up, people don't tend to ask me about the fine-tuning of the universe. They say, what about gay marriage? It's the front uh, front-ended issue that people raise so often with us. And we have a raft of great apologists ready to help us with the fine-tuning of the universe, but I think most of us would agree we are struggling in this area to develop a coherent apologetic. So we're just going to make a start today. And I, I think, too, as we're talking about sex, sexuality, we need to acknowledge, too, that we as Christians traditionally have found it very hard to talk about this issue. Uh, it's part of our culture that we struggle to be honest and open about it. Um, I, I remember uh, w uh, with my grandmother when I was um, a little boy of aged eight, um, hearing on, on the radio um, a word that I thought I knew, but I thought might embarrass her, so I thought I'd try it out on her. And, uh, and I said, uh, Granny, I said, what does the word pregnant mean, you see? And you know what she said? She said, I don't know. You know, I was eight or nine. I don't know what that word means. Now, I was pretty sure she did know because she was my granny. And even I'd worked that out and been listening to the guys at school and was developing some ideas at that time. But I think like many young people in the 50s and 60s and 70s, I grew up in a growing awareness of my having been made sexual and the awakening of my sexual interests and these aches in my body, age 12, 13, 14, I grew up, along with most other Christian young people of the time, in fear and ignorance and shame. And a sense of uh, my body somehow being my enemy and not my friend. And I think times change, but even today, how many of us can say that our Christian home or our church was the place where we learned about the essential goodness of our erotic, <coughs> of our erotic longings. I don't think many of us. And so we, if sex were talking about sex for a food, were food, we tend to give each other the starvation diet in our churches. Now, about the same time I was questioning my poor grandmother in the mid-50s, a man called Hugh Hefner was launching the first mass-market girly magazine called Playboy. And looking back on that era, Hefner says one of the reasons I founded that magazine was because of the, quote, hurt and hypocrisy, the hurt and hypocrisy of my religious upbringing. He'd finished with the starvation diet. From now on, it was going to be fast food. Now tell me, if a little boy of 13, or indeed an older man of 60, is offered a choice between the starvation diet or the fast food diet, what are they going to go for? And so a revolution was born a mighty sexual revolution that's changed our, our culture, really, beyond anything those early activists and visionaries of fast food like Hugh Hefner could, could have imagined. Look at the scope and the, the scale of, of what happened. Here we have the absolute numbers of divorces, and we see as the sexual revolution gets going into the 60s, the number of divorces in the United Kingdom rockets sixfold. 
it then plateaus off. But part of that plateauing is probably related to this other phenomena, and these are the numbers of people getting married. So despite the population growing, fewer people are getting married. And indeed, marriage itself entered a severe and prolonged depression, especially in the poorest areas. It's the poorest areas, sociodemographically, in which marriage has effectively collapsed. Cohabitation, sex outside of marriage have become a norm. Um, and as a result of these changes in many European countries today, nearly half of children are born outside of wedlock. In the UK, by the age of 16, only 50% of children will be found living with both biological parents in the home. And as the revolution continues to unfold, couples of the same sex can get married. And anyway, we're no longer really sure what the word sex means anymore in public discourse. This is the revolution in which we are immersed. And many of us Christians, with, and particularly church leaders, have been hoping that if we keep our heads down long enough, somehow, hopefully, the whole dreadful business will somehow go away. But it won't. It doesn't. We sit here like King Canute, but the waves just keep on coming, don't they? And when our leaders are eventually flushed out to say something about the Christian vision for, say, marriage or the family, certainly if we're thinking about those such as Church of England bishops, what they produce, the documents they produce, read more like the terms and conditions of a software upgrade than a manifesto for human flourishing. They're defensive, they're detailed, they're awkward. We've lost our confidence in this area. So when I stand back and I, I try to take in the sweep of what has happened here, I find myself asking, what is the secret of its success? What, what gave these activists, what gives this revolution such momentum? And Joseph Nye, you remember, the, the political theorist, uh, in his thought about how nations influence each other, he talked about two kinds of power. There's hard power, he said, and the soft power. Hard power is getting what you want by coercion. Soft power is the ability to get what you want using attraction. Now, the revolutionaries have hard power. There's no doubt the activists say the wrong thing, uh, be wise, unwise enough to post the wrong thing on a Facebook post, and you will soon draw the attention of the gangsters of social media knocking at your door. But I think the, the strength of the hard power has, has led us to miss what I personally believe to have been the real secret of the sexual revolution. That was soft power. It's what made its ideas, its moral vision, its ways of life seem so attractive to people. And by being drawn into the culture wars, we've tended to miss that reality. And what I'd suggest is that what the revolutionaries did was they offered new ideas, attractive ideologies, a compelling moral vision, and an inspiring vision, an inspiring story. And if we want to understand the, the soft power of the revolution, we need to begin to unpick this together. So what I'm going to do before I'm going to break in a moment for, um, to get some of your reaction to this, but what I want to do just, just before that is to explore some of these very briefly, and we're skating over these areas, but what, what, what attractive new ideologies? The revolution offered seductive new ideas 
essentially about what it means to be human. At its heart is an ideology that's often called expressive individualism. This is the, the picture of the concept of human as the unencumbered self, the unburdened self freed from tradition and authority and dogma to be who you are. So, of course, we all want to know who, who we are, who we are. One of the great questions we will ever ask in life is, what is my identity? Who am I? Well, the, the revolution came along with seductive ideas about how to answer that question. It says, to find the answer to that question, you look inside yourself. And that is who you are, what you find there. And then you express that's why it's called expressive individualism. You express, live out authentically what you discover to be true inside. In this popular philosophy, based on authentic expression, you claim the right to define yourself. Indeed, you claim the right to redefine reality if it doesn't line up with what you find to be true within. And so we could talk about extreme cases such as Rachel Dolezal, who's been in the news a couple of years ago and more recently in the United Kingdom being interviewed again, reportedly who was outed by her parents. Uh, she is a black civil rights activist, 39 year old, I think in, in the States reportedly, outed by her parents who post a picture of a a little blonde girl, and they say she is masquerading as a black person. And Rachel Dolezal says, they're correct, that is how I was born, but this is who I am. I identify as black. And this phenomenon of expressive individualism, the unencumbered self, the <coughs> authentic self, has made the term, I identify as, one of the defining slogans of our modern era. I identify as. If reality doesn't line up, we change reality. Transspeciesism, transageism, transsexualism, the imperialism of the self. And those of us who work within a Christian worldview do not have to think very hard about where that fits into our understanding of our fallen nature. Genesis 3, you shall be as gods. You shall be as gods. Knowing good and evil, you make the rules. You define the boundaries. Be who you are. So a compelling... Um, attractive new ideology, but then uh, I think actually something even perhaps potentially more important than that even, a compelling moral vision. When the revolution came along, you see, we Christians, we expected to be able to portray the activists of the revolution and its effects in society in terms of our usual laws and codes of conduct in the language of sin. And we expected to be able to portray our opponents as moral anarchists, sinners, depraved. But instead, the sexual revolutionaries cast a vision of a kind of goodness, just a different kind of goodness. The goodness of being real, authentic, true to yourself. The moral claim of authenticity. An authenticity that promised freedom, flourishing, fairness. And it labelled us as the immoral and rapidly now an immoral minority. Forget moral majority, an immoral minority. And it says to us, you continue with your shame culture that you can't tell your children about what it means to be made sexual. You continue with your ignorance and your fear and your condemnation of the little people 
and the ones who don't fit your moral codes, the misfits and the outliers that you drive out of your church, you continue. But this is who we are. Let me give you an example of how, how this works. Take some of the characters you'd see in a, a gay pride march. On the face of it, this looks easy, doesn't it? Um, for Christians faced with explicit images like this of sexual fluidity, um, we, 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 we default to business as usual. Wrinkle our noses, talk about AIDS, have another of our interminable seminars on pornography. People aren't listening to that kind of language. Today, images like this portray moral purpose, the courage to be real. People like this march through some of the toughest areas of Moscow and Eastern Europe with the courage to be real. And they're saying, you continue in your shame culture if you like, but this is who we are. And in case you fail to spot it, we're happy. And look at you. And look at your children. Now, take a, a compelling moral vision of authenticity like that. Put that in the pot. And then put in expressive individualism. And then stir it together into great stories of moral emancipation and courage. Talk about Harvey Milks. And show videos of soldiers and sportsmen with the courage to stand up and say I was bullied and I was pushed out but this is who I am and you have a revolution on your hands because you have a revolution of courage and fight and determination heroes with the courage to break free and of course we know that in rom-coms and sitcoms in movies in literature, the story is told over and over and over again. Be real. Look inside yourself. The latest Disney movie. See what you find within. Be true to yourself. In the words of Madonna, I am my own experiment. I am my own work of art. And Christians, how have we responded to this? with facts. We've responded to stories with facts, with rules, with more seminars about what we don't do. Having, having identified something of, of what's going on very briefly, how do we begin to develop a, a response to this? And of course, I, I, I refer us uh, to the classic apologetics task, which is to connect with the questions of that one's being asked. And of course, you know, you, you, you well know this given the track, but the, the classic um, s s sermon on, on the Areopagus from Paul, and I, I do have a picture of him going round before that, looking at the idols and being distressed by what he saw and writing Romans 1 in his head they exchange the glory of God for idols made by hands of men. You know, he's, he's burning with a sense of resentment and anger and disgust and, and compassion. And he's right, he, all of this is going in his head. And the interesting thing is, how, how then does he relate what is in his heart and his own analysis of what's going on to his, to his audience? Does he start with idolatry? Of course he doesn't. It's a wonderful way that he starts. He connects instead with their spiritual longings. He, he connects with, with what drives them to idolatry. So he says, men of Athens, I see that you're very religious. It's very different from Romans 1, isn't it? Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious. As I walked around this morning. And so he connects with, with, with what he, he senses is somewhere there in their hearts, and he seeks to speak into that. And I wonder whether that doesn't cue us here into a way of connecting with the revolution. We need to identify what it is seeking, freedom, flourishing, fairness, and acknowledge that is part of this. And I think we do have to also acknowledge virtue, 
where we find it. If you've got a lovely uh, gay couple you, who've adopted a disabled little child, you may have your views about the best parental arrangements, the ideal, but the quality of their parenting may put your own parenting to shame. And we need to be, be ready to recognize virtue in complex situations of ethical realities. Um, and recognize that the human heart was still made in the image of God, as disfigured and broken as it is. We long for something better. We long, we sense that there's a flourishing. And this may be the wrong answer, but let's recognize the question in our culture and connect with it and, that not, and appreciate it. So um, I, 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 I think we can, we can do that. And, and then I'd suggest that we can do three things. We can say sorry, thank you, and please to get started. Sorry, thank you, please. I, I, I sense that your, your desire to, for humans to be more not to bring our kids up in shame and fear and to pretend we're not sexual when we all know we, we zing with sexuality, every one of us. And, um, and we're sorry we got it wrong in the past. And there are some pretty hard examples of, of, of stuff we've done as Christians. We lost our vision. We promised freedom, flourishing, fairness. For goodness sake, Jesus says, come set you free. He said, I'll give you life abundantly. God's heart is for the little people. Social justice is our issue, not anybody else. These were our promises. We promised these things, and we let you down so often because we have been bigoted sometimes, and people who didn't fit, we pushed out in a judgmental way, and we're sorry for that. And we don't need to issue... I'm not at all personally in favour of great statements of of repentance and sorrow. I just think if you start doing that, we'll be repenting for everything in our history, won't we? But I think one can say, look, you know, I'm sorry that Christian. And friends, the things Christians do to LGBT people and say are, out, are terrible. They're outrageous. And we need to accept that. And I, I think we can say, and I'm prepared to say, I'm really, I hear what you say about what happened there. And that was a Christian, and I'm a Christian, and I want to say sorry on behalf of that person, uh, but that's not where I am. And so sorry, I'd also want to say thank you. You made us sit up and, and think this revolution. You, you know, you, you've blown the whistle on us. You've said, now come on, what do you really believe? You've flushed us out. We're even having to give talks on this at ELF now. You're facing us to, forcing us to face up to being made in the image of God sexual and to say, what does that mean, for goodness sake? Thank you. That's a blessing to us. It's going to help a new generation of younger people and married couples. It's going to help us as communities flourish as we revisit some of our own convictions. And then please, please, can we do two things in return? We've acknowledged how we failed in our promises. Can we have a conversation about how I'm, a, I'm worried you may have failed in some of yours? I mean, you make big promises here in this culture, freedom and flourishing and fairness. Can we have a conversation, please, about how that stacks up? Um, I agree, ours didn't stack up so well, but how's yours doing if, we're, if we get behind the slogan? And then once we've done that, please can I share what, what I think is the authentic vision, <coughs> biblical vision of, of what it means to be sexual. So those are the two bits to the please. So first, please, can we have a conversation about your promises? I mean, you promised freedom, big promise, expressive individualism. But, you know, if you think about it, it's a slogan. What does it mean? Look within inside yourself. Honestly, I look inside myself and I, I see a shifting sand of doubt, insecurity, anger, depression, depending what day it is. 
On what do I build my sense of self? Is, is there a danger that we simply create a vacuum of need for identity which, which makes us more captive to what our culture wants to sell us? And boy, is our culture ready to sell us identifying labels, LGBT, buy this stuff, get that identity. No, you be yourself, but in case you can't manage that, we have a whole raft of things to help you out. Now, could it be that this psychological cul-de-sac of expressive individualism makes us more susceptible to being held hostage to the dogmas and the traditions that we're trying to escape. I mean, take self-esteem research. There's good research that people who attempt to esteem themselves, I'm special. I attract people to me now. I'm positive. I'm strong. With those kind of self-affirming statements, people who, who practice that kind of pop-level self-esteem route. Nice evidence, I can think of a randomized trial by Hamilton et al. from the University of Ontario. And they found that the group that goes into the meditating on these self-affirming statements, the people with low self-esteem felt worse at the end of the three to six month period. Not better. The authors say these self-affirming, self-boosting statements seem to backfire for the people who need them most. Now, why do they backfire? Because it's just your own propaganda. It's the self telling itself it's special. This is a project of open-ended, ultimately groundless self-making, which I think we need to be more ready to, to expose as being a hollow grave. So what, so what if this is making us more captive? What if that lies behind, for example, some of the safe space culture of universities, that, that the, the self-identified self? This is what we're seeking to do now. We're, we're seeking an anthropology of the autonomous self, aren't we? The self-identified self is simply too vulnerable. It's too insecure. It's too groundless. So it needs to be coddled and served and put in safe spaces. And you must do nothing to make this self feel more insecure, and hence your speech has to be limited. Could this be the kind of mechanism? Friends, I can tell you there's no evidence in the identity-related disorders, such as some forms of anorexia nervosa, patterns of self-harm. There's no evidence that this great project of self-identification is producing any of the freedoms or the flourishing that, that it promised. So we can have a conversation about that. And I think a brother already picked, picked that up in, in the earlier point. This is an opportunity for us to, to get behind the slogans and develop an anthropology of today's autonomous self and begin to talk into that with more confidence. It's a great apologetics opportunity for us. But then secondly, flourishing. Um, what human beings achieving their full potential, that's how we'll understand flourishing, if you'll bear with me as that definition. Surely then, today, people's sex lives, given that the shackles are off, surely they're flourishing. Um, and yet, it appears if you look at actual amounts of sexual activity, the evidence is that it's declining year on year. This is from the Natsal studies, rather good nationwide study in the UK, good representative data. Um, here we've got the median, the kind of an average frequency of sex over the last four months, four weeks. Age 16, 64, 44, not old is, young is. And this is the average number of times you have sex. If you're a woman, it's five in 1990, four in 2000. Three in 2010. Why, says Professor Spiegelhalter, Statistics, University of Oxford. 
nobody will be having any sex at all by the year 2040. <laughs> now, being a statistician, he knows that you must never extrapolate a graph like that. And I doubt anyway that that will be the case. But what's going on here? What, with, with our armies of agony ants and sex therapists and programs about sex, our endless preoccupation with this issue, where is the evidence that people's sex lives are flourishing? And then, of course, we have fairness, and this is a big area um, that, that I'm just going to touch on. But today's individualism views questions of fairness through the lens of the individual, doesn't it? So, my rights and what's good for me. But so often in life, what's good for the individual isn't good for everybody. And in this area of moral discourse, we neglect the language of duties. Indeed, the only thing that gives a person, offers a person a right, is someone else's duty to them. So rights and duties, two sides of the same coin. But the discourse today is in terms of rights. But what if we actually want to revisit this question of fairness in terms of our duties to one another? What if we say ourselves in conversation with with a, an activist or somebody who's interested in our views, we say the problem is, what if the freedoms and the rights adults have claimed have resulted in harms for our children? What if it's our children as a society that are paying the price for our adult freedoms? And, and actually, we, we should be able to connect a little more because we say we're used to thinking about how individual rights don't always lead to um, greater rights, greats for everybody. For example, in climate change, we say it may be very good for me to burn coal in my grate from morning till night because it's cheap from down the road. But when we all do it, it's not good for everybody. So there are some individual rights that are claimed that we are used to foregoing because of our duty to a common good. Now, what if it works the same way in this area of moral ordering of our behavior? I mean, look, just think again what's happened to children over the past 50 years as the sexual revolution has evolved. Nearly half of kids born outside of wedlock. By the age of 16, only half of children found living with both biological parents at home. Now, behind that statistic that rolls off the tongue, friends, kids love stability. If you're navigating a process of psychological development at age two, three, four, at which you're building models of the world, what you hope for your kid is that basic models of trust with the world will be built, that, that, that you trust that you have a place in the world, that you'll be able to navigate it reasonably safely that relationships can be navigated in a way that are productive. But if you come home to a different person, and then you come home to another different person, and then you're put into care, and if your parents are tearing themselves apart, you undermine that process of a formation of a trusting self, and we heap on our children the inequalities and the injustice and the unfairness that results from our, the moral ordering of our behavior as a society. Over the last three decades, the number of kids needing to be placed in care has been steadily increasing, with one analysis suggesting that of children born between 1992 and 1994 in the UK, in that two-year period, subsequently, one in 30 of those children went into care. This breaks God's heart. He loves, Jesus loved children. Ch is it Bacca with his, <coughs> his book, when, when Children Became People, The Birth of Christianity? It was Christians who brought to the world a vision that children matter. And it seems that in our society, it's children who are paying the price for our adult freedoms. And so we want to talk about fairness, but not just in terms of 
our rights, but our duties to one another in ways that lead us to flourish. So there's one of the ways in, in which we can begin to have what I, what I hope would be a constructive critique and conversation with our culture. Do you want to? I'm just going to break there for, for any pushback, clarification. I think the only thing I'd, I would say is, of course, there are multiple factors involved in all of these phenomena. We could analyze the sexual revolution in terms of economic factors. We could analyze it in terms of public health changes. The introduction of the pill, for example, at a stroke separated procreation from sexual activity. So if you're wanting to understand what drove the sexual revolution forward, you'd have to identify multiple factors. But my point is we often miss the strength within that cultural development of these ideological changes and cultural changes regarding our, our moral reasoning that have been going, been going on. Just want to finish with, well, what about this, uh, this question of, we're all longing, do we have a better story? Uh, what does it look like? Um, and I, I think I'd want to say it's important that it does look like as well as sound like something. We, we can take our cue from the LGBT movement. They embodied their beliefs. Remember those guys marching through the streets? They embodied what they believed, and that gave it credibility and authenticity. So this isn't a, simply about what we say and believe, it's about how we live our lives. Now, what is the vision that might lead us to live differently? Well, I, I think connecting with our culture, here's our vision. We say, you know, we share this sense of inner turmoil and brokenness, and we, we share that sense for freedom and flourishing and and fairness, those are really our words as well. But in our story, um, we don't look inside ourselves to discover who we are. We just don't think in our story that that's the, the answer to this sense of brokenness and confusion about who we are. We don't think you find the answer to that within. It's a cul-de-sac, a psychological dead end. We believe in our story, we're made in the image of God. That threads its way through all that we are. Made in the image of God. Yes, broken and disfigured by sin, but being renewed in Christ. And that is how we see ourselves, and that is our identity. So, we want to be ourselves as well. Can we be ourselves? Can we be who we really are? Not a, a groundless, endless, open-ended project of self-making, but a human being being formed in the image of God in which she or he have been created. That's who we are. And so we both want the same thing. We both want to somehow climb out of this sense of brokenness, but, but we have a very, very different way of getting there. We're image bearers. We bear the image of Christ. What you need to understand, and I know this sounds gobbledygook to you, but here it goes. What you need to understand is being an image bearer means that we, our identity is that we become like God himself. So he is a ruler. We seek to govern his world. He is fruitful in our own scriptures. He's fruitful. And so we feel we're called to be fruitful and make more of his world and create more image bearers, which is why family is so important to us and which is why having secure, stable marriages at the center of families, anchoring family life, creating stability is a passion for us because we think kids thrive on it and we think creatures made in his image love that atmosphere, that place of love and security. And so he rules, and we, we try and rule the world, and order it, and serve it. He's fruitful. We, we want to be fruitful. But here's the other thing. He's a lover. He's a lover. That's his nature. He loves. He's a lover. And because we're in his nature, that's how we are. And so for us, sex, this wonderful 
part of our being made in God's image. Here's what it's for. It's for loving each other as God loves us. And that's why sex is so holy for us. I, I was listening to a, one of those TV programs where, um, you know, it's one of these shouting matches, a bear pit of controversy. And the anchor turned to, um, to, to a, a, a leader, church leader, who I think was in a dog collar. So, so Vicar, what's, what's sex for? You see? It's a question you all need to be ready for. What's sex for? In your understanding, what, what's sex for? You see, and he stuttered and said something like, um, it, it, it's for having children. And people laughed. Um, he should have said, I'd suggest, it's for having children and more. It's for loving each other as God loves us, made in his image. You see, I believe, Nikki, I'm made in the image of God. And I know that seems a long way from, from, from these other ways of thinking about being human. That's how I feel about being human. It's, it's at the core of who I am, made in the image of God, which means I can, I've got to love. I bear his image, so I love like he loves. Well, how does God love? He loves passionately. He's a pursuer. He's a romancer of us. He's after us. He sings over us. He delights in us. He's affectionate to us. He has so ordered history that the end of history itself is the marriage supper of the Lamb. He wants to marry his people. He wants to, to be their God, for there to be his people. So we, we love passionately. And of course, we love in lots of different ways. We love our friends, we love our kids, but the most intense expression of God's love is when a man and a woman make love tenderly. And it expresses something of the giving of God, the self-giving to bring delight to another. And that's, so, so sex for us, our story is that it's for loving each other as God loves us. So there's that passion and sensuality, but, but here's the thing, his love is always faithful love. It's always covenantal love. Love at that level of expression and passion is always bounded in covenant. That's what we learn from our, from our <coughs> scriptures. It sounds crazy, it's my identity, it's who I am. Who I am made in the image of God, is someone seeking to bear his image, love like he loves, which means when I love with that real intense passion, if I'm ever called and able to do that, I, it's got to be faithfully to me, because I've got to love like he does. And we call that marriage. He loves for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, forever. And that's, when, when we love with that kind of intensity, we say that's how it is for me as well. Because... Marriage for us is a symbol of the love of God. And in our story, sex plays that really powerful, unique role of showing us the gospel. God has etched into human flesh the story of his pursuit of his people and his giving for them faithfully. And so that, that means for us, in our story, when, when a husband says no to his feelings for a secretary and he binds himself to his wife faithfully, he's being godlike. He's bearing God's image because he's being faithful in his love. It means a single person who says no to a one-night stand and says, no, no, no. If, I, if I'm love at that level of intimacy, it's a faithful love or it's a not at all love. A single person in their body with what they do with their flesh and blood portray the love of God. It's a faithful love. So this isn't only, only married people, it's single people in their chasteness as they bear the image of God who bear witness to the meaning of marriage as an example of God's love which is always faithful and covenant. And I think what, what we seek then to do is to see, you see, this is our story, it's our song, it's our identity, it's who we are. And until we develop a confidence 
that this is really who we are, we'll always feel lacking, we'll be faltering. So this is a story we've got to rediscover in our own hearts, in our own sense of being embodied, in our own sense of sexuality, that it's part of the image of God himself. And what we can do is connect a bit more with those aspirations of our culture. Our culture wants freedom. We say we believe in freedom, but freedom for us comes when we live in harmony with our design, when we live authentically, true to who we really are. That's a language our culture should understand. We believe we're made in the image of God, living true to who we really are. We think brings freedom. Can't prove it to you. We've got to show it in our communities. We're for flourishing, but the word self in our story isn't followed by fulfillment, it's followed by denial. And we believe that because our own saviour, the cross that sits at the heart of our faith, says the route to flourishing is, is self-denial. And we believe that, and I know it sounds crazy to you, and it's tough for my pastor who's same-sex attracted, so he is a chaste, celibate man. This is a route of self-denial, and it's a tough call, but it, ever, it was always tough. And that's what being a Christian means today. It's where the rubber hits the road for us right now. Self-denial. But we believe in free fairness, you see, because it's about our duties toward others. Our duties to build strong families, which are great for kids, and to support in our single chasteness or our married faithfulness what marriage really means, and to sit that at the heart of families. And that is the issue. And what I want to say in to finish, friends, is, is that this vision, this story, isn't about the hot-button issues, LGBT, transgender. We get drawn quickly into it. This isn't about them. This is about us, every one of us. It's about rediscovering, re-inhabiting what it means to be made sexual in the image of God. So there's a, a stab I've made at beginning to inhabit this better story. I have to say I've quite enjoyed discovering it for myself. Um, the, there are some real outward facing issues that we're not going to have time for. In the way, how do we relate this to the public square? Um, can I just say that I've written a little book there, a little plug, it's called A Better Story, surprisingly. Um, and it's published by SPCK, A Better Story, God, Sex and Human Flourishing, Glyn Harrison. Um, sadly, they've sold out on the, on the stall there, but if you did want to get it, it Amazon seemed to have it pretty available. So. And that, that has a lot more data that I've been referring to here and develops the argument, I hope, um, a bit better.